things that are sort of about the quality of HTML and what it displays. And the first question is, what is correct HTML? One of the nice things with HTML, but it's actually a bit problematic, is that browsers, modern browsers, are really, really good at displaying incorrect HTML, at displaying even pure garbage. Uh, they do that in a very nice way. So, for example, you have learned that a paragraph should have a paragraph and tag. Uh, if we just add another p tag in the, in the beginning and we just forget about the end tag, it will still display it properly somehow. Uh, we can do the nesting wrong. We can, for example, do a, a paragraph and then it contains a b tag. Uh, and that means that first the b tag should be closed and the p. If we reverse it, the chance is that the browser still displays it very well. Uh, so oftentimes, and I had lots of discussions previously with students about their assignments, uh, I get complaints that the website looks exactly as we want it to look, but still it's not full points, it's not perfect. And the reason is in many, many cases that it's incorrect HTML. Now, uh, we are not just being picky about incorrect HTML because we want to be, but the problem is uh, if you use bad style or if you write HTML that is not correct, it might lead to errors in cases that you are not aware of. Um, one of them is simply that you might look at it with a different browser or a different browser version and suddenly it looks different than it does on your machine. Uh, so it could be that you simply break the website for some people and you're not aware of it. Uh, the other thing is uh, once we use CSS and once we use JavaScript, we want to automatically process the HTML. We want to add layout, we want to maybe change the, the look of the website when, when a button is pressed or when the user does something. Um, or finally, uh, maybe a, an automated tool like a search engine is looking at your code. So they somehow parse your HTML code uh, and then if it's incorrect, this might lead to errors. Uh, and believe me, in particular, writing code and, and trying to find an error in your code, if the error is actually in your HTML, can be really, really painful and can take a lot of time. Uh, so that there you have to be really careful that you get HTML correct. Um, and therefore, there are uh, style guides, how to give, basically give advice what to do and how to write good code. Uh, and there is a validator for HTML, and we'll look at both of them. So they help you to figure out uh, to write proper HTML. And the style guide is a nice start, so you can look at that. It's the reference number three here. So if we just open that, uh, you'll get some advice on how to code. So for example, uh, something we'll get to in a second, but uh, usually a recommendation is to use a syntax that is close to the XHTML standard, the writing uh, code, but that's, we'll get more there later. Then you should use the correct document type because if you use a different one, uh, then maybe the browser interprets it wrongly and things like that. So these are basically recommendations that make your code more readable. Close all HTML tags. Uh, so actually in HTML5, you are not required to have all the end tags, uh, but you should do that as a convention. So if you start it, you should also end it because uh, you never know what will happen in the future, for example. And I already mentioned it for empty H uh, HTML elements, it's kind of a good convention to add this uh, end uh, indication that basically helps. So these are just some uh, recommendations how to do it nicely so that you can read things. Uh, but then you have the validator. So that's reference number four here. And the validator checks against the standard. So you can, you can send in a URI or you can upload a file or you can even just paste HTML code. And it checks whether it's correct or whether you're actually violating some uh, recommendations. And you can, of course, look at the standard and you can try to figure out what are all the things that I have to do. But the best way here is simply learning by doing. So you could, for example, uh, let's take the basic one. You could just take this HTML code, paste it in here and do check. Uh, and then it will display you all the problems. Uh, so here we only have one warning. It says, well, maybe you want to add a language attribute so that it's clear which language we're using. 
Uh, and why we want to do that, we, we can get to later. But there are no arrows here. But for example, if I uh, forget the end tag for the body, it might give me a an error. No, it doesn't. So that's then because HTML5 does not require me to close it. Um, however, there are other things that uh, might produce an error. One of them is that the title is a required tag, as far as I remember. So if I remove the title, I'll get an error saying the element head requires a title. So that's something you should fix. Um, and let's just fix this here. So now it's validating again. And this will also find problems such as the nesting. So if I, for example, do the paragraph, I do some text, then I use a B tag uh, and then I end my paragraph and then I add my B tag. It should hopefully complain. So you'll see that N tag P is seen, but there are still some open elements that you haven't closed. Uh, B should be closed. So this is uh, one of those cases where the validator can help you. And in this course, we are extremely picky that your code is free of errors. So whenever you submit something, you should make sure that it validates without errors. Warnings are fine for us. Uh, and we do this as discussed because this is really relevant in practice and it's generally a, uh, a good practice to do that. So you should always make sure that your code validates correctly. So make sure to check that. Now uh, we talk about XHTML. As you have seen, that was the recommendation uh, in the style guide to use XHTML syntax conventions. Um, and XHTML is an older standard, which is basically HTML in, in XML format. That's a different markup language. Um, XHTML is stricter. So it, it is basically putting a lot of requirements on you. Um, and it's understood by all browsers. The good thing is it can be parsed by, by XML parsers. So there are lots of tools, lots of libraries that can process XML automatically. So that works. Um, and you can also validate it in the validator. So that's also possible. Uh, XHTML is slightly different. It basically, the first tag is not the doc type, but instead you have this XML uh, tag, which is required because otherwise it's not valid XML. Uh, then the doc type itself, I showed this in the beginning. It has this rather cryptic uh, definition, but that basically def defines use the XHTML1 transitional standard. Um, and then finally, the HTML tag has this additional XML namespace tag. Um, so that's correct XHTML, uh, but then there are a number of additional restrictions. One of them is XHTML is case sensitive. So there is a difference whether you write a ref like this or like this. So it wants to you to use lowercase, uh, whereas in regular HTML, you can just do that however you want. It doesn't matter. Um, XHTML requires you to end the empty tags. So it's not okay to just do like this. And you have to have the end tag. So as we discussed, HTML5 is fine with, with this. Uh, XHTML is not. You have to have all end tags. Attribute values need to be in quotes. Again, this is something that HTML5 does not care about. So this is perfectly fine. Uh, this is XHTML. And finally, the, the nesting has to be correct, even though, as we have just seen, that also is the case in, in HTML5 to some extent. Uh, and now, as, as I've discussed in the style guide, the recommendation is to use these syntax uh, guides. So even though you don't require all of this in HTML5, it's good practice to follow that because it makes things more readable. Um, good, but you can see that in the validator, you can also uh, validate XHTML. Um, easiest is maybe if we go the file upload because there you can explicitly select. Uh, you can say that we want is to be XML1, uh, XHTML1. And now if I select a file, uh, all the files I have are HTML5, so they should actually cause problems. 
in the validation. So you see if we check this, uh, seven errors. And a lot of that has to do with, for example, the XM, uh, XML namespace attribute that I've discussed is not there. Uh, I'm using an attribute that doesn't exist. I don't know what why this is the case. Ah, yeah, it's probably in XM, XHTML. So there, there are lots of things. Uh, I haven't closed my empty tags and so on. So you see that XHTML is much more uh, strict than HTML5. If I use HTML5 here, uh, there should not be any errors. Yeah, sorry. I have to upload it again. You see, and now there's only one warning. So whether or not your HTML is correct depends also on the version that you're using. Uh, XHTML, pure XHTML is really not used so much because X, uh, HTML5 really has more features, is nicer and uh, XHTML has basically disappeared, so not many people are using it. Uh, the reason I show you is, is really the recommendation we have just seen in the style guide. Most people use uh, the syntax recommendations of XHTML as uh, a recommendation. And this is really to avoid errors, like you do with coding conventions in uh, other programming languages. Good, HTML5 um, is, as I discussed initially, it's a living standard. It has somehow, at some point, it has moved away from the fixed uh, standards and was developed by a different group. Um, that's really not so important. The important thing is that really it's the, the standard that is used nowadays. Um, what they did is they removed some old elements and that's mainly stuff that was in HTML for layouting. So in the very beginning, there were lots of tags that were used for layouting. For example, you had a tag called center to centralize text. Uh, and the argument is to say that center or layouting is not a concern of HTML. You should use CSS for that. So they removed this kind of stuff. Uh, and then they added a number of other features. So for example, you have the SVG tag to display vector graphics. Uh, you can define that. You have additional tags to display media like video or audio. Uh, and there are some kind of other features like drag and drop. So they, they added some new stuff. Uh, if you want all the details on that, you will have to look it up in uh, the first two literature references. There is quite some detail on that. The other thing that is really, really important are so-called semantic elements. So HTML5 introduced certain elements that in a, in a regular browser, they don't show in any different way, but they have a special meaning. So it's similar to a diff. They, they don't really have any style. They don't have any layout, but they have a meaning to it. Uh, and that's, for example, the article tag. And if you put text within the article tag, it simply means that this is somehow an article. If you put something in main, it means, well, this is the main part of the website. If you put something in nav, it's the navigation part of the website. So what this does is it just gives a meaning to your content. Uh, otherwise, if you have a P tag, a paragraph, uh, it's impossible to tell whether this is a, a detail, whether it's a header, whether it's a main part. So you only know that it's a paragraph. You don't know what the meaning is of it. Uh, and that's changed with these semantic elements. And the big question here is, of course, why would you do that? Because you can also just use diffs, right? You could just use a diff and you can, if you want to say that it's a header, you could give it a, a class name, for example. Uh, so the question is why? And the main answer to that is accessibility. And this is something, this is a concept that many people sadly don't care about, but it's getting more and more increasingly important. Uh, one of the things we had in the very beginning uh, is that there are different needs in the World Wide Web. I mentioned, I showed you the statistics on internet use. And there, for example, we saw that in Iceland, you have 96% using the internet. In Africa, it's 21%. So internet access is, of course, one of the things. Uh, the other obvious things you might have are that people are using different devices. I'm using a laptop here, you can use your smartphone, you have different operating systems, uh, you have different browsers and so on. 
We don't think about it much, but we obviously have different internet speeds. If you go to areas where there is not much network coverage, or if you go to countries that are not as developed, you might have internet speeds that are really, really slow. Um, and of course, it's finally also the people. You might have blind people or people with uh, color blindness, or you might have people that have that are legasthenics that have harder time to understand or read certain parts uh, you might have different impairments and this is where accessibility comes in um, so the idea is to say that the web is really designed it should work for all people it doesn't matter what what kind of hardware they use software language location ability so really you should make your website as usable as possible um, and the uh, goal of the World Wide Web is to make it accessible to all of these people. Uh, this is of course especially important if you for example are working for a government you might be required to do that if you are doing for example a healthcare uh, provider website you have to make sure that everyone can access it so you have to support for instance blind people. Uh, and not so important, but it might be an extra uh, motivation. If you have an accessible website, it also means that search engines find it in an easier way. Now, how do you make a website accessible? One is uh, one way of doing that is reading reference number six, which shows you a lot of different ways of making your website accessible. Uh, five also has some practical tips. But basically what it means is your website is easier to process automatically. And this is where the semantic elements come in. So if you use a header tag, you tell the tool that is processing your HTML code that here is a header. Um, your diff does not tell that because this here is just some text and an automated tool will not be able to figure out that header means uh, this is the header part of your website. So imagine, for instance, you're blind, uh, then you probably want to use a tool that automatically reads the HTML code and reads it out loud to you. So the sound in your phone or in your laptop actually tells you what is on the website. And that way, if you have these semantic elements, it's much, much easier to figure out, for example, I want to read the main part of the website, then maybe you should use the main tag. Uh, images, for instance, should have the alternative uh, tag, as we discussed before, uh, the alternative attribute, sorry. So this kind of additional text that gives you a description of what is in the image. Uh, because even if the image file is found, if you're, for instance, blind, then you need this text explanation. Uh, you could also be using a tool, a browser that simply does not have a graphical uh, front end, and then you cannot see the picture. So you might want to have the text. Uh, hyperlinks can have titles, so you can give them the title attribute. And then uh, you know the purpose of the link. So you don't only know where it's going and what it says, but it also tells you sort of what can you expect if you click on here. So again, if you have a tool that reads your website, it can tell the user, follow this link to get more information on cats. Uh, meta tags we have seen, so they give you additional information on the website, uh, for example, the keywords. And again, this is something for automated processing. Uh, this is mainly about automated processing, hearing uh, blind people, other impairments, but you should also think about internet speed, browser compatibility, age of users, culture, and so on. So internet speed, for example, tells you maybe you should not use super high resolution pictures for everything because then in some regions people will simply not be able to use your website it's too slow uh, or you should not use any features that you know only work in a certain browser uh, in the first lecture we have seen the example of, of this one design website that was made uh, compatible only for a certain amount of browsers that's really bad practice uh, and then we have more soft issues that have to do with the content or what you put in there. So age of users is often, it's of course not always, but it's often related with more difficulties to, to work with electronic uh, resources, for instance. So maybe there's a way of 
uh, making it easier for them to understand it. For example, it doesn't require lots of technological knowledge or skill. Uh, there might also be cultural issues. So this is something to think about, but it's more on the content level, not how to write the code. Uh, but this is really, really important. Uh, last year we had a guest lecture on accessibility among others, and they sh showed a tool called Google Lighthouse. Um, which is an automated tool that looks at your website and it uh, tells you essentially how good it is in terms of quality. So it doesn't care about how beautiful it is, how, perf uh, how, uh, how it displays, whether it has errors in the HTML, but it shows at performance, how quick is it? So that's for example, the internet speed. It shows specifically, it looks at accessibility. Are you using all the alternative tags? Are you using semantic elements? Uh, it looks, for example, at search engine optimization and so on. So this is, if you have Chrome, you can test this. Um, and it's increasingly popular to also look at these things because it's not only important that your website works and that it has the right information, but it should also be accessible and performant. So this is very important. Uh, but of course, many times this is an afterthought because it's very easy to make a website work and you mainly want to have your content uh, and then maybe you don't think about all of this. So do not forget about that. It's uh, an essential and increasingly important part of web development. Okay, to summarize these uh, lectures, HTML is a markup language that uses so-called tags to produce hypertext, text with links. Uh, and of course, nowadays we have a lot of other things, pictures, videos, structure, essentially. Uh, there are lots of different HTML versions around and usually browsers support all of them, uh, but they might look slightly different in different browsers. And you have to make sure that you use, uh, you declare your version correctly and you make sure it's valid. Uh, a valid HTML document always has a doc type where you declare the version. It has an HTML tag, a head and a body. Um, it conforms to a number of different rules depending on the version. For example, that you uh, close all your tags. Um, but in general, it's very easy to produce HTML that is displayed in the browser. The question is, uh, is it actually valid? And this is something you can check, for example, with the uh, W3C validator. HTML elements and tags carry a meaning, so they have semantics. Uh, and that's really important because the layout can be changed. So you can, for example, we discussed the headers earlier where you have H1 to H6. Um, the important thing is that H1 is more important than H2. How they look, I can change. Uh, and I can change that very easily, for example, using CSS. So the important thing about HTML elements is what they mean not how they display. And finally, we went into accessibility and to make a website accessible, you should follow essentially the, the conventions that we discussed uh, and make sure that things are performant, they run on different internet speeds, they have additional uh, meta information. So that's it for uh, this class. In lecture five and six, we'll cover CSS. So then we finally go away from the pure structure that looks horrible. Uh, but we start by adding uh, layout. And that's, for example, uh, how to add colors, how to position things and so on. Uh, we mainly look at the background, the principles of CSS, and then with lots and lots of examples. Uh, specifically, in the end, we look into the box model and flex box, which is all about positioning things. Uh, and then we end up with responsive web design, which is which has to do with your website adapting to, for example, different screen sizes or different devices. So that's it. Thank you for watching.